another day is to discuss our triangle. Which is this relation between equivalence between three things, memory effects. Aesthetic symmetries. And soft theorem. And the point is that these connections between these two have a kind of simple form that you can see will generalize, which is going to be the main point. So basically, asymptotic symmetries and memory effects are, are related by basically vacuum transition. Essentially, there's a universal form for the memory effect that can be captured by, um, like also labeled by the asymptotic symmetry uh, vacuum. And then um, these are related by Fourier transform. And finally, where did it end? So, basically, uh, even recent papers by Laurent and then also with Yael Laurent and Yang Ray, we're, you're still using this uh, framework in some sense, but now with kind of generalizations of the notion of what is the asymptotic symmetry, because we have this W infinity symmetry or other um, charges supposedly on phase space that we're getting from the whole other corner of the scattering. And then if you understand this derivation, you might understand how, for example, the loop corrections uh, for like the subheading soft theorem are incorporated uh, as like quadratic corrections here. And then like we want with the cubic and higher order corrections to uh, the expressions for these generators. So it's worthwhile even for recent stuff to really understand, I guess, just a couple of these other papers. And so for some context, uh, what was the IR triangle in the first place? You know, the work of Bondi, Vandenberg, Metzner, and Sachs in the 1960s, similar with Weinberg, and then Zeldovich and Polnarev, and some other authors. Um, here. We're looking at basically different aspects of the story. So BMS are studying asymptotic symmetries, which we're going to look at the asymptotic leaf flat metrics and Bondi gauge. Weinberg was looking at soft theorems and Zolovich and Polnarev were studying certain observables. And so the story goes that basically the first set of papers were, I think, some discussion. So the, the interesting thing is now we're trying to connect to the Kumpel Collider literature, and there's actually some unpublished notes by Juan and Sasha that Andy had. Uh, um, this. thirteen was proposing an equivalence between this bottom thing here, and with my colleagues like Soprahar, uh, Dan Temple, and others, uh, various examples of the asymptotic symmetry equals soft theorem uh, discussion uh, with Andy were developed in 13 and 14. And then along came Sasha as a postdoc and was connecting the story for the gravitational case. Uh, so this is And so roughly speaking, once you have one example, the hope would be that the way that we set it up today, you'll see that it's easy to generalize, at least in any case where the asymptotic symmetry is really a large gauge symmetry. And then there's other discussions that Sruti, I guess, has been involved with, with like certain scalar soft theorems and the curvature of uh, your zero mode um, phase space that kind of can generalize this structure beyond the fact, like whenever you have a soft theorem, not necessarily whenever you have a synthetic symmetry interpretation. That's good to keep in mind. So the goal of today, and the room is both back to back, so I guess what we do, to get through, at least be able to understand the following papers. One is by Mitra, uh, the Lysa and Stromanger. And the other is by Stranger and Toyota. And then, if you want a pedagogical review, of course, Andy's lecture notes. So, like, pedagogical. We uh, get 17. We 
want to get through these papers and then there's a bunch of maybe like half a dozen to a dozen or so where if you know how to do it for this super translation example, you can do the same math roughly for any of the other asymptotic symmetries. So that's great. Okay. So let's start with this lower left hand corner and feel free to interrupt me anytime. Uh, in Bondi gauge. So I guess Bondi, Vandenberg, Metzger, and Sachs, they were interested in understanding what um, the, like the radiated phase space and the asymptotic symmetries of that phase space. And so what they're doing is they're first picking a convenient gauge where roughly this radial coordinate is going to be parameterizing geodesics that are going radially out to infinity. And then we're going to be looking at the space of where they end on the conformal compactification. So I'll start by writing the metric down and then I'll also draw the Penrose diagram for the space time so that we are orienting ourselves with where we're sitting. Um, to do. I'm gonna make get long, but it will, if we keep the super translations, we can ignore some subleting terms, which is gonna be nice. Over here. Let's go ahead. So the dot, dot, dot is basically suppressed by powers of one over R. And the point is that what we're looking at is the conformal compactification of Minkowski space has in particular null boundary components, square plus and square minus. And so this is an expansion for R goes to infinity holding U fixed, where U is a null coordinate along here asymptotically, but it's a timely coordinate you can see from this metric at any finite R minus r, and then similarly, along square minus, you have the events time t plus n. All right. So basically, yeah. Oh, sure. So right now I'm only in 4D because I, well, I'm biased by like the super rotations, which I'm not actually presenting. So most of what, like all the soft theorem stuff goes to higher D. There's debate about the interpretation of the soft theorem as an asymptotic symmetry, but it's there's still um, a universal relation between a mode of the graviton that I can define as a current. So all of the celestial story and the charges, so there's a word identity for it, um, but it's just the way that it acts on the phase space isn't going to be as, um, as crystal or as non-controversial. Because basically, in the 4D context, you have the shift in the metric is going to be at the same order as the radiative guy versus uh, just like literally looking at the, the, the Coulombic field of a moving of a mass uh, and it accelerates compared to the radiative field. They're suppressed by different orders in, in R. Um, so all the physics is the same, but the interpretation as a gauge symmetry can, is, is, uh, can be contrived to work with. The physical thing is like is that the soft theorem is a constraint relating gravitational data to uh, matter data, and that's true in NAD. And same thing, there's a there's something like a memory effect. It just might be different orders now. Okay. Okay. So now, basically, in this story, the point is to identify the free data, and so in particular, um, in this one of our expansion, depending on the dimensions, you might have. Um, different relations between where the bonding mass is as compared to where the, the radiative uh, it is going to be. But what we have here is we have basically free data is what we'll call the shear is a function of u, z, and z bar. And then I have other, uh, so this is a spin two degree of freedom that's traceless. And then I have uh, the bonding mass it's just going to be specified on one cut of scry. I'll say this is U0. And similarly with angular momentum aspect, because their evolution is going to be constrained. And so first thing to note is, do, 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 do. Well, let me just break down the constraint equation. So you have this hypersurface on which you're defining your uh, data. So for example, you could do the same thing for a scalar field. It would be a different power of R in the expansion of the field, that would be the data work on literally, say, just solving box phi equals zero. I break this guy into 
a sum over modes. I think it's used to rest with like being explicit by n u c z bar. So I'm plugging in the onset with a certain peeling of the powers in R. I plug this into your harmonic wave equation. It's a little more subtle with a gauge choice. And then I'm literally basically um, writing this out in terms of u derivatives, r derivatives, et cetera. And you will see that there's a recursion relation taking you into the bulk. And that the uh, coefficients of it are such that you have basically zero times um, the, the order in one of r that's free. And so basically, you'll mechanically try to solve this recursion relation. You'll see that you need to specify one free function of u. That's one particular power in number r. And for the metric, it's also the spin to traceless degree of freedom. And then you'll have integration constants that will appear at different orders in r. Uh, and the ones that appear, these leading guys, are bonding mass and momentum aspect. But there's some debate about whether or not to consider charges that are also coming from the integration constants of subleading order. So that's an aside. Yeah. But basically, the point is, is that the reason why these guys are only specified at one cut is because if I look at Einstein's equations, and I look at Einstein's equations that need to be satisfied along that hypersurface, so these are constrained equations, I have the following thing, right? Einstein's equations, where if I were in flat space, um, basically this n is null normal, is some combination of the u and r derivatives, that would get correction statues say null in this metric. Um, what I would get then is that the bonding mass has a simple evolution form. Two, three, D, and maybe let me call this. This is the new. I'll try to introduce notation earlier enough. So we have that, and then we have uh, minus the matter term. And I've been glib here because this isn't just the uh, stress sensor, it also includes basically what would end up being the shear contribution to the stress sensor. So I'm going to define this PUU as follows as one quarter MZZ and ZZ plus. Plus basically um, following leading uh, contribution of the system. Okay. So there's another similar equation for the D U and Z, but because I'm going to focus on super translations here, I might as well not write it down because it's just going to be more of this, more of time. But um, I can buy the process section that's going to make um, this guy. But okay, so we have basically relations coming from first the U component and then the uh, Z component for NZ, and then the uh, leading behavior of the R component is is subleading for this class of metrics. And so we're literally just solving, we're, like what Bonnie Van Everberg and Sachs are doing is they're picking a gauge, and then in that gauge they're solving Einstein's equation. And for asymptotically flat space times, you have no cosmological constant, so that's why there's no lambda G mu term here, and you also have a non-trivial stress sensor. So at some point, uh, there's going to be some sources. And there's a little bit of a balance of like what uh, sources are physical. And so you, they're worked out the various ways. So C is going to be a free function of U. And later, we're going to come back to exactly how these profiles have to behave at late and early U. But for now, that's it. So any questions before? Next. The asymptotic symmetry group is follows the law of symmetry trivial ones, so let's understand what that means. So the question that we have is roughly our class of asymptotically flat space times is specified by some radiative data and then something akin to basically the analog of like ADM uh, mass, but now for cuts along fixed U. 
uh, and the angular momentum aspect, which is subleading in R here. And so uh, if I had a boosted, say, short sound solution, oh, sorry, yeah? Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. There should be no J. Where did I? Uh, sorry. Here? Oh, sorry. I'm just saying that the normal, uh, if I ignored all of the radiative terms, so I, like, I actually just look at what's a null vector that is the null normal here, uh, there's a d by dr part of it because mu is technically time like, right? Until I take r goes to infinity. And then you can see that if I take r to infinity, this guy is order one versus this guy's order r squared. So it becomes the Corollian metric zero time. Are you used to? Are those partials are partials. Those are partials, sorry. So they're <laughs> d by d, yeah. I, yeah. Oh, okay, I don't even, that's not even better. That's like, what is that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I made that better. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So then the notion of a lot symmetry versus trivial symmetry uh, is going to be, we want to still preserve this gauge. So basically you can see that the condition here is that if you're going along uh, R at fixed uh, U, Z and Z bar, it's a null geodesic. So we don't want any uh, diffeomorphisms that would break that. And then, so roughly speaking, you're solving for what uh, diffeomorphisms are gonna preserve this class of one of our falloffs. But then the modding by trivial is anything that basically only hits subleading order. And so roughly speaking, large gauge transformations as used in Andy's friend's cohort is roughly uh, gauge transformations with um, non-comeback support. So. So by this, we just mean we preserve our gauge choice and then we transform. You can already see where there's something slightly unsatisfying about that, that uh, you're picking a gauge to do the statement about what the asymptotic symmetries are versus in principle, um, you know, like the soft theorems are going to be just like a physical observable. You can phrase them in terms of the field strength and infinity. So, yeah. but let's write out what these super translations are. So the super translations have the following form. Not G. And then at subleting order, you can have uh, depends on the metric a little bit. And then there's similarly a class of super rotations, which start as follows. The point is that if I uh, just let f be um, up to some uh, factors of like one plus z bar because I have a round square metric, be like the uh, L equals zero and one modes, that would be just the global translations. But I can take a lead derivative of that metric along these vector fields with an arbitrary function of the celestial sphere. And all I'll end up doing is keeping the same gauge. And you'll also see that, for example, the Shear is going to shift. Um, and then I similarly kind of preserve this form of the metric away from contact terms wherever I have poles in Y uh, with a super rotation, which is giving you a Durasora symmetry as opposed to the Lorentz symmetry of, uh, of 40. So that was neat, and that's why the whole 2D CFT story came about. But a priori, the interesting thing here is that what Bonnie Vandenberg, Metzger, and Sachs did is they were, I guess, trying to find um, Poincaré, uh, and they got something a lot larger. Um, and so, and if you want radiation, I think this is key. If you want radiation, sure. Yeah. Which okay, fine. So if you kill radiation, you can have Poincaré, but yeah. the whole point is that they yeah. were forced to get BMS. Yeah, and we want right walk ahead. Right. And they were they didn't yeah. like it at the time. Sure. No, we like it. We like it. Now, but also, yeah. 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 We like it. Fine. Um, 
because now that we have symmetry enhancements, the whole point of the celestial, sorry. So, so just to take a breather with that is that if we have um, a larger symmetry group, then as much as we're waiting for all the time that we waste on studying kinematics, the point would be that you have larger mul symmetry multiplets. And so then once you know how to separate out the parts that are the BMS multiplets from the interesting physics, yeah, sorry, sorry, oh, I'm not doing that yet. Sorry. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. oh, I'm sorry. So that's preview maybe for the future talk on okay. what, what the angry promise, which is also amplitudes, which would be um, right. Uh, the question of uh, basic. Sorry. So uh, in the language of people who do Corollian physics, the analog of having a CFT uh, primary on like the time like boundary, but now it's at this null guy is. Um, Rolling primary that when you smear along you goes to the B spaces or you can or you turn them and get a momentum space. So the point would be that you can uh, look at the collinear limits of gravitons with uh, amplitudes and uh, with uh, another particle in a scattering amplitude, and then basically label all of the states with like collinear gravitons as like um, descendants, right? So like the analog of a uh, Virasoro primary versus a uh, quasi primary would have more collinear gravitons. And so one could imagine if you organize the your multiplets of this these asymptotic symmetries as opposed to the symmetry group that now there are fewer states. But um, not for today. So um, maybe Banerjee would be a good reference. I should point that out. So one thing that's going to be the problem here is that this guy is not going to be zero uh, for like uh, it's only zero for translations for the global part. And then kind of intuitively, you can see already where you're gonna have a linear term in the charge. Uh, if I wanted to induce a, an homogeneous shift of my metric, uh, the part that's homogeneous is gonna be like a dagger A with some kernel, like when you write down say the energy momentum tensor for a free scalar, that would do this type of shift. And then um, you're gonna just shift by a C number. It's gonna be like um, a linear term in the metric. So I'll make that more precise in a second, but that's already the first hint that you have a, uh, a soft there. Good. So roughly speaking, let me go to next board. Okay. Right. So let me just think that this is much larger than ever. And as uh, Celine pointed out, we like it, they didn't like it. Okay, so good. So from here on out, we're just gonna focus on super -changes. All right, so what is actually gonna implement that shift? Uh, Andy and friends just borrow from the Brussels group these expressions for the gauntlet charges. So what are we doing? We're basically looking at the past limit of future null infinity. That's 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 um, subgroup. That's great plus. And we're measuring the Bondi mass. So if f were just a constant, we'd be basically taking the total energy in some sense. Um, but now uh, there's a little bit of a subtlety of taking the past limit of future null infinity as opposed to just sitting at some finite time along spatial infinity. We're taking the future limit of past of past null infinity. And that's going to be a, a important part of the claim that Andy's going to make. And so roughly speaking, there are two things that were either insights or guesses or whatever you want to frame it. Uh, is that you have this asymptotic analysis of scry plus, you could do the same thing at scry minus. Uh, and the question is going to be, is there an actual symmetry of scattering by which I'm saying, if I shift my initial data, uh, is there a compensating shift I can do on the final data? So it's really looking at the same, just symmetry image of the same as matrix element for right. So Andy was claiming that there is this diagonal uh, subgroup, which is the symmetry of the S matrix. And that this involves totally matching our parameters. So this guy at 
So basically, I add totally. And so we're so glib with it that we'll literally use antiquotally related celestial sphere coordinates for the two. So it just looks like the functions are the same in and out. But once you be careful with some of the expressions there. And then this, so that's the first insight. And so basically now, if there's a claim that you can relate these quantities that are actually infinitely separated amounts of time, right? So in this Penrose diagram, here versus here is a full T goes like infinite amount of time evolution. So it's not trivial that you'd have a relation that's really simple between these two uh, points. But they make the claim that there is. And then once you have that claim, you can go and check it because you can literally just assume that you can match this guy to its corresponding quantity at sky minus plus, and then proceed forth from there, which is what we're going to do in follows. And then the statement that there is a uh, symmetry came from the fact that he's able to show that the word identity is equal to the soft term. So uh, let me pause there to say some interpretation of that. Roughly speaking, you could say that bond event, oh yeah. Just uh, sorry, yeah. like do you assume anything on the, the shear to write Q plus? I mean, do you so, assume so you're gonna, fall off of you? You're gonna eventually need to make those assumptions to actually match, um, like, sorry. So like, for example, you need the bonding mass to, to match two if you wanna really say these charges are equal. Um, but on top of that, there's a symmetry, sorry. So you need basically the behavior of the fields themselves to be something that you can match or control uh, the, the news here. So roughly speaking at late times, you're gonna have uh, CZZ asymptote two. So CZZ goes to negative infinity is gonna be roughly a two DZ squared of some C minus. I guess you could call it. So you just keep the sum so, so in we're going to uh, eventually. Um, I still think, strictly speaking, you would you would need to just match the bonding mass in F to say the charges are equal. And then when you integrate, maybe certain quantities are going to diverge if you don't have the right U fall offs because the the soft charge is going to evolve uh, an integral of the news. Um, and then also um, for the. Like, I think it also doesn't make sense necessarily to match S if you're not matching Cs because you want to do, if you did a lead, um, if you did a leader of it of the metric and then you shifted this guy, if you're not shifting in and out, you'd be breaking the antipodal matching with the aspect symmetry, so it wouldn't make sense. So there's a sense in which, yeah, you want to have certain balls so you can see that the <coughs> ensembles you have for this matching is consistent with the boundary conditions you're assuming at like you. Yeah. Basics. I guess you, yeah. I, I know yeah. what you want is no news or no D U of C, but you and it's okay like, with something like yeah. The soft so for the super rotation case, it's you need a faster ball off. Um, to see that you wrote like yeah. this is where it's a, it's a it just doesn't depend on you, right? This doesn't depend on you. So this is just a function of z and z. Right? Just a constant. Uh, so the new is at zero. You take exactly. But the question is, is how bad is the tail? Yeah. And I think for the super rotations, we need it to be a little bit better. Okay. But yeah. But for this guy, just the the limit being this form, I think is consistent and fine. And the bonding mass. So, all right. Okay, so no, this is good because basically, I think, and maybe we can also debate about this. Like, one could say that the people who are studying the asymptotic symmetry analyses are making rigorous statements about, uh, like, say, what the canonical charges are, and like that phase space mirror either square plus or square minus. And then the Ward identity proofs are kind of actually showing that perturbative scattering has the obeys these symmetries. And so, um, for example, I think that Andy might try, like Barnage and others were proposing super rotations as a symmetry in like 2011. And then is it a symmetry of the S matrix to what extent the 2014 result is saying that versus you could already see it. So question mark, but, but I think there is some value to literally seeing that scattering does obey these, these asymptotic symmetries. So, okay. okay, so the way that we're gonna proceed is maybe, I want to emphasize it's easier than you might think it might be, especially once you're given, once you're given this and once you're given the constraint equation. So actually let me towards a little bit. All right, okay. So 
once you tell me this and you tell me that, I can just play games and rewrite everything in terms of turn this boundary data into data here and here. And similarly, you know, square minus. And so let me do that. So the thing I'm going to do is just, I guess it's kind of silly to call it Stokes theorem. It's more like integration by parts. So something new is going to be G that you goes to okay. So if I have some function, I can do this. So why don't I choose to do that with this guy? So basically, as far as the function of u, I'm saying that the value of this bonding mass at a given early time cut, I can just as well write in terms of the late time cut and the change to, like in bonding mass in the middle, right? So what am I saying? I'm saying I can rewrite my charge plus as a contribution from sky plus plus the same thing. Okay, so I've done nothing but choose to write the this guy in terms of its u derivative here and the late time volume of volume mass. And so basically, one could think intuitively, okay. So the whole point of this, this symmetry is that I want to say that the bonding mass for my out state is equal to the bonding mass for the in state, even when I wait with an arbitrary function on the sphere, which is not trivial compared to what we think of as like total energy conservation. Once I have that relationship between the bonding mass near spatial infinity, then I have now something in in equals something in out. And in particular, those in guys can be phrased in terms of any sort of massive contributions coming from I minus, and in the final state at I plus, and then um, radiation that came through. So let's unpack a little bit here. If I had a, just a massive particle, so I don't have any horizons, so I don't have like short stuff, um, then this bonding mass would be, uh, if it was like just in my rest frame, would be what you think of like Newton's law, right? Um, but now if it's boosted, it's gonna have some angle dependence. And so roughly speaking, it's just there's extra contributions from the moving masses, and the same thing will be seen uh, perturbatively for massive particles. If you had a like a massive particle that you then are looking to look at this off there, would give contributions here. But in Andy's first papers, we actually do a cheaper trick of just setting this to zero by assumption of that being in the massive scattering process and ignoring, uh, assuming that at late times you have no um, mass in the system. You don't need to do that. Uh, it just makes your life easier. So if you only have masses matter, then basically you're going to just have energy uh, leaving or entering through scry. So you kind of can just deal with it. Um, but that and the fact that we're going to jump between harmonic gauge and bonding gauge were two things that, like I guess, various people were giving us shit for. It. Okay, so are you think? Um, I will, I will. So I'll take it to zero for now just because I want to, but I don't have to. Okay. okay. Yeah. So because I'm just going to follow the derivation in the original paper, which is just assuming mass, only masses matter and that everything's radiated out. But one doesn't need to do that. Okay. And also to keep in mind, like, right, the point would be if this is a soft theorem, you would expect that your soft graviton, well, sorry, I'm going ahead a little bit, is going to couple to massive or massless fields. And this guy is only going to capture the massless field. So you need another contribution. So it's not like you can see where the other contribution comes from. So. Okay. So then basically the statement of the word identity is just uh, explicitly show the relation where these charges of a soft and a hard contribution, and this is Q soft, and this is Q hard. Right, the point of this is this is just coming from basically inserting in a time order product the identity that you want and be uh, in, sorry, I guess that's why. Okay. 
that's the thing. And we're gonna just insert these operators into our perturbative S major filaments. And the whole point is that we know how to evaluate them in perturbation theory. And so we can do this. So now let's just do that. And uh, I will, we have the, the room is going to be taken at our so I'll try to grab out things we don't need. Not that okay. So, all we're going to do is we're now going to go to our lovely free field expansion that we're using to prepare the asymptotic states when we're talking about scattering. And it's going to have some sum over velocities, integral over on shell momentum. And then our polarization vectors. And our, uh, um, plainly states. Great. Okay. So then, basically, the thing that we're interested in is we're interested in evaluating QS. So this board is all about evaluating QS. And so, what do we need to do? We need to take some derivatives. These are covariant derivatives on the unit S two, and we need to evaluate this NAB integrated over U, which is going to be a uh, zero mode of the metric. And so if I want to pick out CZZ, the harmonic gauge that you would normally use to write these polarization tensors down versus Bondi gauge still have the same radiative degrees of freedom. And it's a matter of uh, how you write the rest of the metric in terms of the free data data that distinguishes the two gauges. So I can extract out CZZ as follows. So kappa is square root of 32 pi G. And I take limit argos to infinity of one over r h c v u r, and then all I'm doing is literally uh, dx mu by dz to get h z infinity. So I can do that. And then um, now what I'm going to do is this I plug in, and the second thing I plug in is that e to the i q dot x is the following form. I am taking u fixed and uh, r large. This guy is rapidly oscillating. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to have just this plane wave phase that's gray, and then this angle between x hat and q hat is going to be uh, localized to the saddle point where they're collinear. And this makes sense because if I'm sitting very far away from something and you throw me a ball or you like, shine a laser at me, then I know what direction that laser was pointing to get to me. No far enough away. So that's good. So basically what's gonna happen is that you do these, you plug in this and this into this, and you get the following. The CVZ is just um, the Fourier transform. In particular, the ZZ component only has contributions from one combination of helicity. So, um, yeah. This is what I have. And so I only have a Fourier transform left over in omega. So this guy is a function of u, z, and z bar. And these guys are a function of z, z, z and z bar and an energy scale. And so, so yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, good. Why h mu nu depends on r? Is it uh, where? Like, h mu is supposed to be literally just the, I'm looking at the, uh, the free graviton uh, asymptotically. Okay. Uh, okay so because x is like u and, oh, okay, that's the r that is there. Okay, and then it's yeah. like, okay, yeah. right. okay. And, okay. So, Basically, the way that I would want to think about it is that an operator inserted at the conformal boundary is preparing a state 
And so it's very much already like an extrapolate dictionary that we're using here to say that we can just as well take our earlier like Cauchy slices up to the conformal boundary. And then on that, if I wanted to prepare a wave bucket, I basically put an operator smear it appropriately along scribe to prepare that plane wave state or uh, put it just at a point on scribe to prepare a um, excitation that affects you. All right, cool. And now the thing that I need from here is the following. The thing I want to evaluate is going to be this integral du of the news. So AB component. And this is just integral du. So the derivative of the shear. And so right, I take a u derivative here. I pull down a power of omega here. So what I'm basically going to be doing is I'm going to be inserting this omega times a into my outside in this case. And the same story goes for repeating the analysis at, at fast infinity, which is important for the actual order. So all I've done is taken a U derivative and taken the integral. The integral takes me to uh, delta function in omega, but I have an omega integral. So it basically is taking the limit here. And there's a little bit of splitting the difference between positive and negative frequency parts, which is an important one half that we're, um, you guys stuck on. So, yeah. so basically I already see my soft charge should be uh, the Weinberg pole. So what I'm saying is, is I know it's gonna be, it should be zero if this guy were uh, regular as omega goes to zero. Uh, because I'm sending omega to zero, but if there's a pole, that will survive. And so why would there be a pole? That's a theorem by Weinberg. So. And so, what I have is the following. I think I'm going to skip the Time and also fine. So I'm going to take the whatever example of scalar refinement rule. Sorry, but the point is the following: what I have is if I've inserted in my S metric solution of state, and now I've inserted QS. This state has an additional uh, soft gravity. So if I want to sandwich that with an arbitrary in-state and look at the uh, scattering matrix, then basically what I'm computing is something of the form where there's some number of things in my out-state and some number of things in my in-state. And the point is, is that if I compute this perturbatively, if this is my soft graviton, then in the limit that I'm taking omega to zero, the only terms that are gonna give me a pull in the energy, which I would need for this guy to survive, are gonna come when there's an extra propagator that has uh, a singularity in, in Q's energy. And so schematically, this is only one of the class of contributions because I could just as well attach to any leg, but if I just look at this guy, so I have momentum Q here with energy omega, I have some particle PI, and I have PI plus Q here for momentum preservation at this vertex, then up to whatever spin dependence here is gonna change the propagator, this additional propagator right here is going to have the following form. So I was sticking to massless mostly throughout, but just to show that it's still, well, okay, let's just stick to massless. So I, Two squared minus I epsilon because P is on shell. This just turns into um, so eta is a sign because if I attach to an ingoing like basically the momentum conservation would flip the, the relative sign here. But because my external legs are on shell, the P squared part vanishes and the only part that contributes because again Q is null. So this is zero, this is squared is zero, this squared is zero. So the only part that contributes is like the Mandelson invariant of these two. And that's p dot q. And so I get that guy times whatever numerator factor I get 
which depends on uh, see the momentum of the particle the graviton is coupling to. And Weinberg's result from 1965 was that the, no matter what the spin of this uh, guy is, I have a universal form for the soft theorem. Yeah. Is that I'll stay. Over to over time. Okay. So basically, this only depends on the momentum of the particles that I couple to. I get a contribution that's weighted by a sign for all of my incoming and outgoing legs of the spike I couple to. I have this guy coming from the propagator, and then I have some polarization dependence here. And so you can literally explicitly just evaluate that by plugging in like your parameterization for your on-shell momenta and the polarization vectors when it does it. And so basically this gives us the Q soft side of this evaluation. So now I just need to give you the how to evaluate the uh, Q hard, and then you can just plug and chug the soft theorem in. So let's do that now. So now all I'm going to do is tell you how to evaluate Q hard. As we see that Q hard is already the shear inclusive anic or proportional to it. So this guy is just our anic. And so what do we expect? If we expect a of omega, I'm going to sip I guess Z. A dagger of omega. So Q hard is like the TUU, which was the contribution of the matter, right? It's a U integral, right? So then, yes. So you're gonna evaluate why it's Sorry. I'm oh, I'm just showing like kind of. I feel a little bit bad. Like when we were doing it before, we just like literally said, "Oh, the Q hard measures the energy," but it's actually easier to just see it from. Uh, uh, I feel like it's slightly more instructive than what Andy did in that paper. Not that much more instructive, but okay. So I'm literally saying that if I insert. My so in this convention, there's an omega squared here because of the one over omega and then uh, a dagger a. So I insert this operator on a state that is a single particle state. And because the anic operator would annihilate the vacuum, I can just commute it through. So this guy is equal to the commutator here. <laughs> and so this is just proportional to a double function whenever the anic operator is collinear with a particle uh, and then measures the energy of that state. And so I can see that in most of the scattering matrix elements that I'm computing at, say, entry level, I have these well separated. Particles. So sorry, 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 sorry. I'm not coming up. Yes, that's right. So you have to put them to high and regular. And now what you do, you. I'm just saying that I can write Q hard is supposed to be the time integral of the stress sensor. The unit of the stress sensor. Yes, yeah, so the matter. Right. And so the stress sensor, if I like evaluated it for a scalar yeah, field or whatever, like it would just be this energy weight of a dagger, a number operator weight by energy. Oh, okay, okay. So that's just. Yeah, like so you can hard. actually see it. Yeah. Right yeah, you act on. I act on any of my out states, and the point is, is that this guy, so the anic operator is support on one runner or sky, and then if each of my single particle states are in different directions of the night sky, I either get zero when there's no particle in that direction, or I get the commutator. So Laurent's going to use manipulations like this for his higher spin choice. Right. Uh, okay, and so the way that it's read in Andy's paper is just saying, okay, I know that the matter charge is supposed to induce like the representation of the matter fields of the symmetry. But here at least you can just also use A's and A daggers for the matter fields too. Good. And 
so then the point that I want to make here is how this contact term is going to be consistent. So I have Q hard and Q soft, but what I told you was this N term here, N T U U. So I have these derivatives hitting it. And so roughly speaking, the way that you're just proving the word identity is that this guy measures the outgoing particles. There's a similar term from the in that measures the massless finite energy, like the energy uh, incoming. And then the soft theorem couples to both. And so uh, this funny business with the half coming from how you're taking the A versus A dagger uh, was to make it so that the soft theorem doesn't double count as compared to the hard part of the charge to get the word identity to work. But again, that was swept under the rug. And now basically the way that when you plug it in, it works out is that this contact term is what you expect when you look at the soft theorem. So I want to basically say that D A D B of any of any of these U integral is going to give me this contract term, the contact term, which has support wherever I'm measuring the energetic uh, excitations from the other fields. And I get that from looking at the soft theorem by just the fact that if you look at the uh, form of the soft theorem, you roughly have, say, z bar minus um, w bar over z minus w, and you're taking two z bar derivatives of it. So up to covariant derivatives and whatnot, you basically see that the soft theorem, which has support at, uh, like the graviton will, will basically uh, have like very um, not collinear contributions. So far away in the celestial sphere, you're measuring the energetics of the other particles, but those guys are just Green's functions for this differential operator that's appearing in the soft charge of the word identity. And so literally plugging in the soft theorem, plugging in the anic operator, taking the appropriate derivatives of the soft theorem, uh, they have to cancel, and that is the word identity as phrased in terms of S matrix elements. And so we've proved Andy's result. And so that's the first, the main thing I wanted to show. And then until the next group in days, I'll make a brief comment about the memory effect. Okay, so the other thing I want to point out is basically this integral of NAB for uh, my space times also has a very universal form. It's uh, delta of C A B, which I said after uh, um, Celine's comments. So let's say let's look at the ZZ component. I guess maybe you can find. It's a uh, two z squared delta c, which is a scalar mode. And so, basically, the point is that the object that I care about here is really uh, the early and late along scry uh, data of the gravitational field, and that in particular, it takes a uh, simple form in terms of what I could kind of call a vacuum transition if I wanted to. But the point is the physical thing is the difference. Um, and so it's, I guess, uh, the thing that we're seeing is the following. So basically we said the residue, the Weinberg pole. implies that you're gonna have a vacuum transition. So the extent to which, uh, you're fine parameterizing your phase space by like not a lot of super translations, but um, like you basically don't have square integrable uh, radiated data. And that's a problem that Gotham and Wald are addressing in different ways. I think they're trying to apply a more algebraic quantum field approach, but that paper with Sam is out, so I don't know what they're gonna do. Um, but basically there's various kind of, so the fact that the Weinberg falls on zero is telling us that we have these second transitions, but you can also see that that, residue of that Weinberg pool 
has various physical observ uh, observable consequences. And so because it's going to be a to zero, you're not going to really see it as far as like uh, your mirrors moving back and forth. But there's going to be this DC shift and kind of a different class of observables kind of would naturally measure that. And we can use inertial detectors to do this. So I will just tease and I think we're on time. Yeah. Uh, where, like, what happens? Like, here it seems to be this effect of the memory effect of yeah. this of theorem is related to the fact that the shear transform is like DDF. Yeah. And that's why you have like this scalar that you can see yeah. naturally. What happens if you don't have DD of the scalar, right? If you have like yeah. a scalar or like. Sure. And like, how much is important that you have DDF and not like. Another I don't know, like. Like, okay, yeah. now it's uh, C is a tensor, but you can imagine it's so, like lower. Sure. So, maybe the first statement I would make is that if you have the charges right and you ask how does the soft operator commute with the gravitational field expansion, you should see that it would generate a shift of the uh, metric by dz squared of f. Mm -hmm. So, at least you, you see the form is consistent with the charge, but otherwise, literally to evaluate the word identity, if nobody told you they can't match the symmetry, you could just see that some differential operator acting on soft theorem equals energy operator and never ask where it came from. And that's the extent to which you have soft theorems that are like, if you have a universal form of a soft theorem, but you don't have an asymptotic symmetry interpretation, you still might have part of the IR triangle to the extent where I can tell you what observable there's a memory effect. And there's a soft charge and a soft theorem. And then I think Julio Paramatinas and others are trying to uh, kind of generalize the statement of asymptotic symmetry side to incorporate another leg of it. Like what is, what is it actually meaning? Um, but if you have your set of scattering matrix elements for any number of inner and out particles, and suddenly there is a vanishing, so like why would it vanish? Either it's some equation of motion or like uh, there is some redundancy, right? So either symmetry interpretation or an equation of motion should tell you that the so, okay. good. So, I don't know if I didn't fully answer your question. I think I agreed it. Yeah, So, then the last point is just to make some fun connections of experiment. I have some particles moving along some little line with tangent vector t and their separation s. And the geodesic deviation equation is telling me. Two, and then I can take my proper time to replace the U, and same thing with T is roughly U by the U, and I'm taking Argos infinity, so I'm looking at some inertial detectors very far away. What you will find when you literally just evaluate the Riemann tensor for your bond gauge metric is that the component that you're going to need is proportional to some U derivative of the shear. And then your geodesic deviation equation turns into as follows. And roughly I can integrate up twice and then the only kernel of that is some constant mode and a linear mode. And so I'm gonna get that basically this net shift of two detectors, um, if I wait long enough, is gonna be proportional to the super rotation vacuum transition. So it's going to be so basically um, there's like the thing that I want to point out is that you evaluate the soft theorem normally in this discussions of the memory effect which is kind of cute so there's this debate about inclusive versus exclusive processes and in the whole study of the S matrix we're always looking at literally a fixed outstate in state and basically inserting other operators at square plus and square minus and seeing a relation. But in principle, the actual like memory effect is defined as an expectation value uh, in a given state, like for a process. So these are actually coming from an inclusive, like a, it should be a, like a tenfold contract if you actually want to do it properly. Um, so I think the statistics of the soft radiation is what's giving you roughly that the probability of emitting another um, photon or graviton is proportional to the web of it. 
but that's beside the point. So what I'm saying is right now, in, I want to basically point out what you're actually doing to get Sasha's result. So essentially the thing that you need to know how to do is just to go from the bonding gauge metric to the physical observable. So that's what they're doing with this geodesic deviation equation. But you could just as well take bonding uh, gauge detectors, which are basically accelerating. So they stay at different points in the night sky and look at say like time delays of different um, like lights being bounced off of detectors at a fixed C. Uh, and then they're just plugging in the bonding gauge metric to get this result. And then integrating a couple of times to get the, the fact that, you know, that CZZ shifts by kind of universal form in terms of this super translation vacuum. And so they're relating basically the classical expression for the gauge field to its Fourier transformed expression inserted in S matrix element. And so roughly speaking, back to this IR triangle picture, you're looking at the same physics in different bases. You put a lot under it. Um, and it's not that bad. And you can, the point is you can repeat it for different things. So for example, Freddie and Andy proposed a new soft theorem. And then we showed that there is a symmetry of the S matrix in the same manner with the subliving soft theorem, which is then, okay, now the super rotation symmetry scattering. And then we found the observable that projects out the super translations. Um, but yeah, so it's not that bad, hopefully. And then the funny thing about it is that people, we're still kind of using it the same routes to look at these base space symmetries with higher particle uh, terms that are coming from uh, the holomorphic collinear limits of scattering and seeing if you can construct some other word identities. So it's not like it's too old news, but that's what I wanted. Yeah. Like I took up with the leading one. Yeah. And I'm very confused because um not about the leading, that's right. But after like people look at function correction to the yeah. software, yeah. or also like there's this log software, like this uh like the I yeah. lock in um yeah, so the quantum corrections we can understand more readily than I think I mentioned a lot of ones. Quantum corrections, you literally become another operator insertion. And so then you're seeing if you take the soft theorem, it's different than the one that you want for the stress function. But then the other operators that are quadratic in the fields compensate that exact. So, where, what is, why, why are you in quantum? Because you have an expansion in the H file? Um, so, so, in, sorry, maybe I want to phrase this better is that the, the um do you see it at loop order uh as far as like the actual like soft theorem like that for three level is just what it is when like Freddie and down but then there's effects coming from um I guess they phrase it in terms of like the the soft cloud um let me see if they needed to do that roughly speaking the fact that the uh the like econal like uh like loop like uh, correction to the amplitude also affects then the, the subbitting soft theorem because you're expanding okay. that to next order. Okay. And well, that's yes. the origin of it for them. And then, yeah. So each other you go more subtleties because you have like more effect that like have to be coded, right? The leading you don't have quantum effects, just tree level, and then if you go to the next one. Oh, I mean the thing is too is right the the argument here that only these diagrams are going to contribute was sensitive to the fact that I wouldn't have any other pull in the energy from other diagrams, and so then it's hard to make that argument for uh, other things. And so the way that you get around it for these holomorphic symmetry algebras is that they're looking at the leading collinear singularity more so than the leading um, soft singularity. And then you can look at like the BCFW shifts and see that like for a certain, like when do the other terms not contribute? Okay. And then as soon as they do, that's where Yang Gray has a lot of fun time uh, trying to see if we can understand like the like other terms and like the, the sub sub leading yes, or sub leading for gauge. But then instead of taking the sub, you take the collinear. So to get the holographic like, similarity, they're, they're taking a collinear limit and there's a universal form for like the part that is coming from like the BCF. W shift, which is like these two, the collinear splitting function. But is that everything? Like, not necessarily.
but yeah, but so there is a sense in which I think the thing to emphasize here is that one could find from the S matrix the statement that there is a word identity even if you might be scared to assert the word identity. And that's where Laurent is excited about these like multi-particle operators and trying to check it in amplitudes because there you have a kind of too strong concept because you have a symmetry of self-dual gravity. Um, why would it be a symmetry of the full S matrix? Well, can we see if it is? <laughs> like, can we see what amplitudes it is for? And then work back from like for physical reasons for why. This is what what well, Roland was looking at. Yeah. And one of the models, yeah. yeah. So your double poles are in the collinear limit, though, yeah. Yeah. And so you guys also have a better handle on like multi particle terms because you know the OPD instead of, yeah. I think right there now. Yeah. We're only kind of guessing it from the algebra of like the glitter and phase space, which is not the same algebra as what you would expect from collinear limits by priori. So it's not clear that the operators are the same. And that's where we wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Adam, Adam was explaining to me yesterday, like yeah. the consistency of the OBE is pretty much the same as the absence of the uh, Consistency of the symmetry, like, sorry. I wouldn't, I think the multi-particle terms are fine, but then they ruin the question of like the symmetry algebra, like those statements of the. For tree, tree level, um, and, and, and maybe also from uh, rational model of amplitudes. Uh, like, if there is a problem, if it has to come from one particle, you, you could also have cancellations, like you have a moment right in the channel, but there's a certain cancellation, so it's still fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but yeah, so I'm saying that the multi particle operators, we want to be, oh, well, I want the multi particle operators to be there because I care more about the like the notion of trying to recast uh, celestial amplitudes in terms of like celestial OPEs as opposed to the existence of these larger symmetry algebras. Um, that seems more fundamental just generally to scattering versus to specific theories where you have these symmetry tensions, which are really interesting in their own right. Um, so the fact that you don't accidentally assume associativity breaks <laughs> is a good thing. <laughs> and if the multi-particle guys say there, that's fine. Thank you.